Hello, and thank you so much to everybody for joining us here today to hear about quite a special moment in the history of Oxford's Word of the Year. And we will explain all shortly. Um, but firstly, a little bit about me and my connection to Oxford. Um, I'm Susie Dent, and my day job now essentially involves sitting in the corner of uh, Channel 4's Countdown Studio. But for the first 10 years of my life with the programme, I was very much involved with Oxford Dictionaries. I was working for Oxford University Press in their Dictionaries team. And I was just one of several word referees uh, who came from OUP to Countdown from time to time. And although I took up a full time role on Countdown in the early noughties, my allegiances and my love have remained with Oxford. Um, thanks probably to my abiding love affair with the Oxford English Dictionary, which is my desert island book, bar none. Um, and I've stayed involved in spreading the word uh, about Oxford's selection of the word of the year, which is why we're here today. But before I introduce far more important people today on our panel, I'd also like to invite all of those who've joined us. And once again, thank you just to submit any questions you have via the YouTube chat. Um, and you can use it at any point in the discussion and we will come to your questions at the end of the event. So on to the people who are in the know and who've come together to announce something quite unique today. I'm going to ask each panellist to uh, introduce themselves and to let you know their role in these very important proceedings. So first up, uh, welcome Fiona McPherson. Hi, Fiona. Hi there. Yeah, I'm Fiona McPherson. I don't have quite the illustrious biography that Susie does, but I am an editor with the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, specifically involved in adding new words to that tome. So uh, I'm one of the people that can be blamed if new words that people don't really like are being added, but it's all based on the evidence. Um, and I've been involved in Word of the Year for quite a number of years now. Some of you may have seen me uh, do various bits of publicity for it. And it's very exciting to be here today with you all. Thank you. But we're really excited to have you. Uh -huh. um, next, Jonathan Dent, no relation, even though we're asked that all the time, Jonathan. Um, please, can you tell us what you do? Hi, I'm Jonathan Dent. And like Fiona, I work on the Oxford English Dictionary, which is our historical dictionary of English. I work on the revision of the dictionary text, so researching and defining uh, English words and senses uh, over the course of time. Um, and I'm originally from Lancashire, um, and before I worked at the OED, where I've been for 12 years now, um, I uh, was a student and researcher on medieval and Renaissance literature. That is impressive. Is that a copy of the OED behind you, Jonathan? I can't quite yeah. see. I actually haven't got one at home. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, we'll need to remedy that. Um, <laughs> thanks, Jonathan. Catherine Martin, up to you. Hi, Catherine. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Martin, and I'm product director for Oxford Languages. But I started my career at OUP many, many years ago as a lexicographer working on the New Words team for the OED. So the word of the year is very close to my heart. <laughs> yeah. Um, and finally, Ben, Ben Zimmer. Hi, Ben. Hi there, Ben Zimmer here. Um, I'm a bit of an outsider for this group, but uh, but uh, I actually have my my lexicography roots with Oxford. Currently, I am the language columnist for the Wall Street Journal. I write a weekly column called Word on the Street, which uh, looks at words in the news every week. Um, another thing that I do is I'm chair of the New Words Committee for the American Dialect Society. The American Dialect Society has been selecting a word of the year um, since 1990, in fact, sort of the granddaddy of all the word of the year selections. Uh, and I've been overseeing that um, in my role with the American Dialect Society for a decade or so. But even before that, um, as I mentioned, I, I was involved with the uh, Oxford's uh, uh, lexicography projects as well as editor for US dictionaries, um, working out of the New York office of Oxford back in the uh, mid to late 2000s, aughts, noughties, whatever you want to call that decade, uh, with, with Catherine and others. And um, I have fond memories of uh, selecting uh, word of the year. Back then, we had a US word of the year, which I was involved in selecting and got to announce. Uh, and Susie would make the announcement on the UK side. Um, now, now it's uh, sort of joined up again. And I'm very pleased to be part of the, uh, the rollout and the discussion today. Well, we're delighted to have you. Ben, can you remember what that first American dialect word of the year was? 
back in uh, 90. The, Sorry, put you well, on the spot now. The, the, the very first one back in 1990 was uh, one that was swiftly forgotten, and that was Bush Lips, which <laughs> do with a promise that then President uh, George H.W. Bush was making about no new taxes, which he then <laughs> went back from. Ah. Bush Lips apparently meant at the time uh, insincere uh, political rhetoric. Uh, so not all of the word of the year choices have been so successful. But, no, but that's part of the interest, isn't it? They can be yeah. fly-by-nights, but they really meant something at the time and are really useful exactly. distillations of their time. I think that's a brilliant example. Um, well, thank you uh, so much to all of you for introducing yourselves and your, your role in this. Um, so I think we need really an overview of what word of the year is. And it sounds obviously very transparent. And I think all the journalists um, watching will know exactly what happens every year. Year, but they may not know the process behind it. Um, so Fiona, can you give us a, a sort of brief history of Word of the Year and, and what it is exactly? Yeah, I think <clears throat> Word of the Year has always for us been the chance to step back and do something slightly different to our ordinary work. Inevitably, the focus there is on researching uh, words or phrases with a view to future inclusion in one of our dictionaries, so with the OED in, in my case. But with Word of the Year, it was always a little bit more fun. It's about seeing if we can identify trends that have emerged and analyse language to see what it might say about society, its moods, uh, reflections or preoccupations. You know, is there something which sums up a year or at least can speak to part of a year or part of what's going on and some of our experiences? Because obviously societal changes or preoccupations um, they influence language and they become reflected in our language. And as interesting we've just been saying, sometimes that can be in a really ephemeral way. Not every word necessarily has the staying power, perhaps like bush lips, for example. <laughs> um, but a word that was everywhere in one particular year, but then vanished, you know, it doesn't matter if it ends up in a dictionary or not. That doesn't disqualify it from being a candidate for word of the year. In fact, it might even make it more suitable as as a, as a classic word of the year. But in saying that, in terms of the words that we've chosen previously for the Oxford word of the year, I think there's only a couple that haven't yet, and that's important, yet made it into um, one of our Oxford dictionaries. Um, and in some cases, though, it was quite a time afterwards. It, that's, that's not that surprising. Words can take a little bit of time to become embedded and perhaps emerging as a word of the year or word of the year candidate is the sort of, can sometimes be the start of that process into becoming a fixture in, in our minds and, and in our vocabulary. Um, yeah. It's important to say, I think as well, that a word of the year needn't be a neologism. It doesn't have to be something brand new. And in, you know, in doing this job, you become very aware that even words that you think of as brand new, once you start researching them, it turns out that they're not that, they're much older than you think. It's just the external events, and those can be good or bad, positive you know, and negative, will bring a word to prominence and give it that extra, extra significance in people's lives. But I think what seems indisputable is probably that a word of the year captures the imagination of people quite significantly. I mean, I have people asking me months in advance of what has now become word of the year season. Uh, what's the word of the year going to be? And I know that that's true for a number of my colleagues, even those who are much more tangentially involved. But even during the time that I have been involved, and it's quite a few years now, I can see how it's really changed and become something much bigger than initially it was. I mean, I mentioned a piece of fun earlier. It was quite seen as a little bit more of a frivolous thing. Oh, yeah, word of the year. Um, and it's now become so much bigger and so much more anticipated. And the year I noticed the big shift in it, I think, was 2013, when uh, Oxford chose selfie as its word of the year. That was probably the year that selfies went mainstream. Uh, you know, the technology was emerging, which made them easy to do. You could do it so much easier with a phone rather than, you know, standing with a camera, outstretched arms. Um, so therefore, because of that ease of, of being able to do them, they became ubiquitous. Um, and it seems to me that ever since then, word of the year, certainly in terms of the Oxford word of the year, has just become this bigger thing growing every year and something that really gets people excited. Um, 
you know, we haven't always done the same thing. We don't always do the same, uh, follow the same pattern. As, as Ben said, sometimes we've had two words, a, a US word and a British word. Um, sometimes we've chosen words which are a bit more lighthearted. Sometimes they've been really serious. Sometimes everything's been on a theme. Um, and we've sometimes chosen, we haven't chosen a word of the year. We've instead chosen words of the year because for us, there was no meaningful way of narrowing that down. Um, and the whole year was characterized by linguistic change and evolution. Um, but I think at its heart, word of the year is a really good way of getting people talking about language and it can be a snapshot of social history reflected in that. Yeah, fascinating. And it's interesting you mentioned selfie because that is mm. actually quite a good example of a word that wasn't a neologism actually, because that yeah. went back further than we thought, didn't it? Yeah. Oh, from memory, I want to say about 2009. But yeah, as we as we researched it, we found out, oh, actually, this this isn't new. Um, yeah. it, it's not really old in the, you know, in the history of language terms, but it was definitely older than than we probably all thought. Yes. And likewise, we were talking a little bit just before uh, we came live that Chav exploded yeah. onto the scene in 2004. But actually, that's we think a fairly old, very old, actually, Romany word with a very yeah. different history. So um, I think two, yeah. two really good examples there. Um, and also worth saying that the Oxford word of the year does not have to be a word, a single word, because we <laughs> always challenged point. on that. Very good point. <laughs> yes, it can be an expression um, or more than one word. But um, that is fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, Jonathan, over to you. Um, Fiona's talked a little bit about um, the sort of exercise and, and how it, I suppose, is more of a kind of subjective exercise normally than most of our dictionary writing. Would you say that's true? Could you tell us a little bit about how uh, this is researched, you know, what, what the data is that we are basing our choices on? Lexicographical research takes many forms, even within Oxford languages. Uh, and we have specialist teams working on both current and historical English lexicography and bilingual lexicography and on language monitoring and analysis. And our approach to all of these different types of research is evidence-based. So we define and describe language as it is as I think Fiona has already touched on, rather than enforcing a particular form of the language. So quite a lot of my time is spent gathering and presenting quotation evidence for our historical dictionary, the OED, um, from databases and evidence submitted by users and readers. Um, and those are for those words that have shown the staying power that Fiona was talking about to enter a historical dictionary of English. So um, been around for a while and we can attest to quite a lot of use. Um, wherever possible, we use corpora or corpuses, and I don't promise to be consistent on my use of those plurals, um, both of which are available. Um, these are large bodies of tagged electronic text, so the words are all grammatically tagged and we can analyze the sentences. Um, and it allows us to analyze on quite a large scale um, linguistic patterns and trends, um, which words co-occur quite frequently, um, development of, in senses of existing words or words moving into different realms from maybe limited um, circulation in particular specialisms uh, and the emergence of the kind of new words and neologisms that we're most used to talking about in terms of words of the year and which Fiona again has talked about. Um, for the monitoring and lexicography of current English, we have access to a 19 billion word corpus. I always ha sort of have to pull myself up to make sure that's uh, uh, the correct number, um, but which is updated monthly uh, with new content from the web from all around the world um, and cross-checked against other corpora. Um, and this monitor corpus is our main resource when thinking about word of the year. And it allows us to see fluctuations and increases in usage over the course of the past 11 or 12 months um, and to produce a report which reveals uh, linguistic changes and the linguistic newbies uh, of the past year or so. Um, and from that report, um, a list of candidates is drawn up, which seems, as Fiona says, to, us, to say something about or to encapsulate part of our experience about the past year. Fantastic. 
Thank you. I always think uh, corpus and corporate is just such an alienating word for what is the most exciting database. I mean, just everything is poured into this database, isn't it? Just from scholarly journals to newspapers to novels to yeah, all evidence of current language. So they're actually just these incredibly vibrant living things. Um, so I sometimes wish we could choose a slightly different word for it, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that is fascinating. Thank you so much. And um, it, we talked a little bit about, about um, you know, past words of the year and um, and our approach and, and how we have chosen these and what we're basing it on. But this year is something quite different. And OUP is changing its, um, its method, really, uh, quite fundamentally. I'm going to turn to you, Catherine, just to explain what this approach is and why we've taken it this year. Sure. So, as we've been discussing, Oxford's been declaring a word of the year for almost two decades. And as Fiona was noting earlier, when you look back now, you can see that over that time, there's been a subtle evolution in the types of words we've chosen, and also in the way that those choices have been received by the public. Initially, we often chose a word, for example, podcast or selfie or vape that was linguistically prominent and culturally significant, but that was grounded in a sort of circumscribed aspect of the human experience. Um, but recently we've seen a trend towards these words that have a more universal resonance. Um, and in my memory, 2016 was kind of a breakout year for this type of word where we had the choice of post-truth in a year where that really um, seemed to be a concept that was permeating many different aspects um, of uh, culture and politics all around the world. Um, if we look back to 2019, we had climate emergency. In 2020, we had no single word at all, but we did a deep dive into this huge number of new words and usages that arose that year as the pandemic was impacting every aspect of our lives and our language. And then last year in 2021, we had vax, which was a word whose usage had increased enormously but also one that resonated deeply with not only sort of the hope of the end of the pandemic, but also with some of the enduring polarization uh, that the pandemic exacerbated. And of course, by the end of 2021, the Omicron variant had complicated the idea of a clean end to the COVID era, which is how we found ourselves here in 2022. Um, <laughs> This year for many people did mark a return to something that looked more like the, the before times, as we used to quaintly say. Um, people were reuniting with their friends and family. Um, people who had been studying or working remotely for over a year began to return to their workplaces and their schools. But they didn't necessarily return to precisely how things had been before. So there's this opportunity for change and the workplace and its power dynamics were in flux. Meanwhile, we have devastating war in Europe, natural disasters around the world, chaos in global supply chains, crisis in the economy, rising inflation, threats of recession. There's political change and political crisis, widespread concern that democracy was under threat, even in places where it had seemed secure, and fear that rights that had been taken for granted might suddenly be revoked. So people were making their voices heard online, at the ballot box, in the street, streets and in some places at great personal cost. So that brings us to the present moment where after a year like this, with so much change, it felt wrong to keep the same old approach to our word of the year. And that's why for the first time this year, we're opening up the choice to everyone so that people around the world can have an opportunity to vote and to have their say. You know, we always say that dictionaries are a mirror on the people who speak the English language. They're not uh, a map or a guidepost to how you should speak. They tell people how they really do speak. Um, they reflect the world, the, the world of English speakers back at themselves. Um, every English speaker contributes to that evolving story of the English language. Um, and it's how we communicate with others, particularly during difficult times. So with that in mind, it just didn't feel right for a small group of people behind closed doors in Oxford to sum up the year 2022 in a word. We wanted to embrace a more democratic approach uh, to our selection process this year and give people the opportunity to reflect on their experiences and choose the, world, the word that best characterizes the past year to them. 
So our lexicographers have researched and reviewed evidence on prominent words and phrases that have grown in usage over the past year. And they've selected three candidates for Oxford's Word of the Year in 2022. Um, and now it's going over to the public to decide which one of those is going to be the winner this year. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. And I think it is time now to look at those three words that you have highlighted uh, as experts um, and that the people will get to uh, decide on. I like to the people, the people's choice now. Um, so uh, here's a short video for you introducing the three contenders for the Oxford Word of the Year 2022. Every year, Oxford University Press searches for the word that will capture a moment in time but lives on to say something about our history. A word that is surprising, evocative, and sometimes not even a word at all. This year was no different. And yet, this year has been so different. 2022 is the year in which we saw the consequences of our world opening up again. And so, it only felt right for Oxford to open up its choice of the word of the year. For the first time in its history, the Oxford Word of the Year will be chosen by the people that shape language every single day. You. We've assessed our language data and narrowed down hundreds of words that have grown in use. Each one of these words is relevant to the year in a different way. But now, we need your help choosing just one of our three finalists to be crowned the Word of the Year. Metaverse, meaning a virtual reality environment in which users can interact with one another's avatars in an immersive way. Hashtag I stand with, recognizes the activism and division that has characterized this year, used on social media to express solidarity with a specific cause, group or person. Goblin Mode describes behavior that is unapologetically self-indulgent, typically in a way that rejects social norms or expectations. So, which word will be 2022's Oxford Word of the Year? Over the next two weeks, you decide. I have to, I'm so excited by this because um, this is true democracy. I mean, English, as we always say, is, an, is a democracy. There is no guiding authority telling us what we can say, what we can't say, what is correct and what is incorrect. And this really feels like the word of the year is going to reflect that, um, you know, that authentic approach. And I love it. But we should probably, of course, uh, start with the obvious. Why these words? What do they mean? And, um, you know, what is the basis for, for their choice as a candidate for word of the year 2022? Uh, so, Jonathan, can I ask you, could you lead on a metaverse, please? Yeah. Um... So we define Metaverse as a hypothetical virtual reality environment in which users interact with one another's avatars and their surroundings in an immersive way, sometimes posited as a potential extension of or replacement for the internet, World Wide Web or social media. Um, it's Although it's a word that's been around since 1992 um, and has had its own entry in the relevant sense in OED and other Oxford dictionaries and data sets for some years, uh, up until this year, it's been a relatively low frequency word in our corpus, um, but we've seen it more or less quadruple, quadruple over the past year in use in that corpus, not least thanks to high profile moves by one tech company to embrace the concept of the metaverse. Um, in origin, it's a word from science fiction. Um, so our first citation in OED is from the novel Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. Um, in which people go into this uh, virtual world or virtual universe using uh, virtual reality goggles um, and interacting with one another's avatars. Um, and that book itself was originally conceived of as a computer-generated uh, graphic novel. Um, looking at currently evidence in our corpus um it's around the kind of hypothetical and projected nature of it is reflected in the fact that it's most prominent collocates that is words that occur near it in text are as you might expect zuckerberg for one um virtual reflected virtual reality nature platform builds so the idea of building platforms and uh vision um 
it's also linked quite strongly with Web3, uh, which is emerging quite strongly this year as an alternative to the more established Web 3.0 as a way of talking about a future iteration of the internet, and also with the related terms NFT and crypto. Um, I think as well as reflecting uh, our the extent to which we are interested in social media and our experience of uh, the world and communication with one another is mediated increasingly by social media and the internet. It also perhaps represents ongoing questions about ownership and regulation of new technologies and especially those means by which we communicate, share information and do business. Um, and thinking about what's going on in the world at the moment online, um, there's all that movement between what is also called the Twitterverse and the Fediverse of federated servers um, represented by um, sites like Mastodon. Um, and it's one of a cluster of um, current words um, denote, like those words that denote uh, online spaces which use that verse combining form from universe, um, which also include cryptoverse. So I think it's interesting because it's a word that's been around for a while and has seen some um, surge in use um, these days. It represents that kind of the extent to which we're enmeshed in social media and it's kind of our uh, reliance on the people providing um, that media and the platforms that serve it. Um, and it, it'll be interesting to see if some of the sort of uh, some of the things that are imagined for the metaverse, even as early as Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, like kind of two-tier interaction of, uh, with it by its users, depending on what kind of access they can afford, um, and people wanting to escape into the metaverse more permanently, um, whether those remain things we're still talking about um, in the future. Okay, and do you see it as it's sort of almost like a safe space, I suppose, that we, we can um, crawl into, given that it, it is so immersive. So, you know, possibly mm -hmm. a reaction to um, everything that Catherine's been talking about in terms of, you know, what is happening around us right now. Um, so really interesting. And as someone who had a VR headset on over the weekend and was trying to walk the plank um, and, and failing, um, I, I, I'm definitely sort of in tune with the metaverse, I think. Um, ben, I'm going to ask you uh, now, one of your favorite subjects, I believe. Can you tell us about goblin mode? <laughs> Yes, I, w I was uh, pleased to see that uh, Goblin Mode was uh, one of the choices available for people to, to vote on. Um, goblin Mode, you know, again, a, a more of a two-word phrase or compound phrase, but still, of course, uh, a fine selection for Word of the Year. Uh, Oxford dis de defining it as a type of behavior which is unapologetically self-indulgent, lazy, sovereignly, or greedy, typically in a way that rejects social norms or expectations, frequently in the phrase uh, in goblin mode or go goblin mode. Um, and this is, it may seem a bit frivolous, but I, I think that goblin mode really does speak to the times and the zeitgeist. Um, and it is certainly a 2022 expression, although uh, you can find examples of people referring to goblin mode on Twitter going all the way back to 2009 or, two, or 2010. Um, but it was a, a, a few um, uh, social media posts that kind of went viral uh, starting in February of 2022, that really brought goblin mode to people's attention and people just really have latched onto it, at least on social media. Of course, uh, um, that is not always a reflection of the way that uh, language is used elsewhere, but uh, these days it's often a very good barometer. Um, and so, you know, what we see with goblin mode, um, you know, this idea that, um, you know, uh, perhaps it emerged as a kind of a coping mechanism in the pandemic era. Again, all the things we've been talking about that the world has been going through. And, you know, we, we see on social media sometimes, uh, for instance, on Instagram or TikTok, um, a lot of people get very wrapped up in presenting themselves, self-presentation. And it's all about uh, kind of curating your image uh, in a particular way. Um, and Goblin Mode just goes against all of that. Um, so, you know, we've, we've heard recently about these various kinds of aesthetics that people have uh, latched onto, you know, often they end in core, like cottage core, um, which, you know, may be subdued or put together in a particular way. Goblin mode, it's kind of like, we're just going to let it all hang out. Um, and it, in a way, it's interesting because, you know, as, as we kind of emerge from the past few years of, of, uh, of you know, lockdown and so forth, 
Um, people are looking at social norms in new ways, I think. And something like goblin mode to say you're going to you know, go goblin mode or be in goblin mode, I think it gives people kind of the license to ditch some of the old norms, sort of put those aside and embrace new ones, um, not be so concerned with, uh, you know, with, with what went before in terms of the way you're supposed to act, the way you're supposed to look. Um, it could, of course, uh, be seen as this sort of very self-indulgent move, but um, at the same time, again, it, it, um, I think it does speak to the way that uh, people react to these times, and as particularly the way that uh, uh, we present ourselves to others, particularly over social media. And it does this very interesting thing of combining these two terms, goblin and mode. Of course, goblin uh, coming from, uh, uh, you know, folklore, this sort of mischievous sprite type creature kind of associated with uh, nature and things that are, are, are sort of going against more, you know, cultivated or civilized society. Um, and so it's kind of this idea that you can just turn on this mode with where the word mode we might be familiar with from use in, uh, you know, software. There are lots of computing uses. Uh, um, and, and also from, you know, video games, uh, there are different types of modes. Um, and there are some interesting precursors, I think, to goblin mode that show how it was possible for it to take off. So for instance, the term beast mode, which was just recently entered in the Oxford English Dictionary just last year, um, is a great precursor to it. And uh, beast mode actually comes out of this, um, uh, trans the Transformers television series. There was a, an animated series back in the 1990s where those robot characters could turn into animals by saying, you know, beast mode. And so the idea of going beast mode or into beast mode, um, go, you know, goes back all the way that far and then has has uh, become popular in song lyrics and, and other things as well. Um, and so now goblin mode sort of like plays with that frame of like, you can just sort of switch on a mode. And now sort of, you know, if you go goblin mode or, or go into goblin mode, um, it just means, you know, I'm just going to put aside all of these societal expectations for a little while uh, or, you know, just let it all hang out. And that's just something that we can do. You know, we, we can we can present ourselves. We have different different uh, types of, uh, of uh, you know, ways of expressing ourselves. And this is the one where we just sort of let it all hang out. So I, I'm, I'm very pleased that this is uh, one of the choices, in fact, because I've been tracking it for the American Dialect Society word of the year as one of the possibilities uh, as a word that sort of cropped up this year. And I'm actually going to be writing about Goblin Mode for the Wall Street Journal for my column later this week. Excellent. Thank you. And you were talking about sort of how adept we are at, at um, shifting from one mode to another. So Goblin Mode is, is probably not a permanent state. It's what it, it's it sounds like a little bit of um, selfish self-care, um, if you like, <laughs> that we can we can enter and then leave at, uh, at will. Is that is that how it works? That, that generally seems to be how it is. And uh, yeah. especially if you see people, uh, for instance, on TikTok, uh, kind of um, giving a kind of a, a video uh, a view of what that would all look like. It yes. is something you can sort of switch on, switch off. It's like, well, yeah, okay, yeah. I can't, you might not be able to be in goblin mode 24 hours a day. You have to be serious and professional in your, in your work life. Yeah. But uh, when you, you know, when you're at home and, and you can uh, feel just sort of more natural and relaxed, then that might be when goblin mode hits in and like, you know, you don't care about all of those expectations. It's quite like language, actually. We can go into goblin mode language, can't we, where we can just sort Absolutely. of, you know, be uh, as, as rough and ready as we like. But then obviously we have to observe professional context. Um, and my other very quick question was, uh, and you mentioned TikTok, because I think this is where it really has spiked, um, as far as I can see. Um, but is, is it becoming a community mode? So a collective mode rather than a sort of individual's choice to retreat for a little while and be self-indulgent is there actually a kind of community of goblins um <laughs> i don't know if it's quite so structured like that okay. uh, i'm not sure if you would find that again it does seem sort of uh, more kind of a loose and informal thing as opposed to those aesthetic movements that i mentioned before yeah uh, like cottage core and other things ending in core this is something yeah where where people will just say goblin mode activated or i just went goblin mode and just show a video of them you know Lying on the couch and, you know yeah. whatever whatever they're doing <laughs> and and yeah. so it's it's uh, like i was saying before kind of a reaction to more sort of curated cultivated um aesthetics that might attract their uh certain communities that way and this is just something that's a bit more wild and reckless I think. yeah 
Fantastic. Yes. Brilliant explanation. Thank you so much. Um, and Fiona, finally, over to you. Hmm. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about the um, the hashtag I stand with? Yeah. So to stand with as a phrasal verb, uh, you know, as a way of showing solidarity with a person or cause, obviously has a long history, uh, goes back to the 1300s. But the use of it as a hashtag, of course, comes quite a lot later. Um, but it's demonstrating the very same idea, albeit in a more stylized form. It goes back at least as far as 2009 on Twitter, so hashtag I stand with. And I think Twitter is the platform that it really remains most synonymous with. Um, it may go back earlier, um, but it can't go back any further than 2007 because that's when hashtags uh, were first in use on Twitter. In early 2010, we are seeing a cluster of hashtag I stand with Obama. And from then on, it's, it's become used, as I said, in this way of showing solidarity um, for a person or a cause, um, you know, showing support. You can also see it um, as a standalone hashtag uh, preceding the name of the person uh, someone is, is standing with, if you like. But you can also just see it as I stand with, hashtag I stand with, and then the rest of the post will perhaps explain exactly uh, where the person's support is being directed. Um, undoubtedly, the use of a hashtag I stand with uh, on social media is intended to show solidarity with people or situations. I mean, that's where the verb has its has its origins. Or it can also be, I suppose, a desire to take some kind of action um, on something that it's not really possible to do anything more directly about. The great thing about social media is that it unites people from all corners of the globe. And by using hashtag I stand with, people are able to at least show solidarity for something that may be happening hundreds or thousands of miles away so they can't do anything more directly about it but they can by use of the hashtag you know show their support but I think for that reason it's perhaps all too easy for some people at least to have denounced it as something that really doesn't require any effort or certainly little effort it's it's slacktivism in action if you like um, but I don't think that's what people using it have as their as their primary motivation but by the same token, as well as showing solidarity and uniting people behind a common cause, it does also demonstrate, I think, the, the divisions that we have in society and actually how easy factionalism can emerge. For every hashtag I stand with X, there's a corresponding hashtag I stand with Y, um, usually taking up an opposing uh, position. And indeed, when you see trending uses of hashtags, hashtag I stand with um, they usually come in opposing pairs so you will actually see them both perhaps trending at the same time um, the analysis that we've done shows that in March 2022 there was a spike on social media of hashtag I stand with particularly in reference to the war in Ukraine um, and that was also reflected in our own corpus in news reports um, about the war and about people's reaction to it and, and how people were were dealing with it um, this increase in prominence was particularly seen in hashtag stand with Ukraine. Now, in this case, there isn't the personal pronoun I there, but really whether the I is there or not, the same support is being expressed and therefore the two really are interchangeable. Um, without the pronoun, I mean, it can, I suppose, be seen as a bit of an interjection or an invocation or an invitation to others to, to stand with Ukraine in this instance. Um, analysis of other corpora, and indeed of social media at the time, um, shows that also shows a surge in usage around this time for hashtag I stand with, with the I being bracketed, but both as a phrase or a standalone hashtag. Um, I think all of this really says something quite characteristic about 2022, um, in that it shows the ways that we've come together in solidarity after you know a difficult number of years, nothing really changes there are still difficulties and horrors in the world um, so it's a way of us coming together and showing this solidarity and, and perhaps expressing how we feel about something but it's also showing where we differ and where we form different camps and we've given our support to different causes i mean you know maybe it was always that way but i think it was certainly a notable notable feature of, of 2022 we have come together in lots of ways 
but we've also remained divided on probably just as many things. And I think this is demonstrated by the prominence of hashtag I stand with. It can do both of these things, even if the original meaning behind it was always going to be to show support. And I think this prominence in its usage um, and what it's saying about the world is why I think it's been chosen as a candidate for Word of the Year. Thanks, Fiona. Fascinating, all of these. This is really quite a hard choice, this one, actually. Ben, can I just ask you quickly, if you, you can just give me a one-minute answer to this. You're external to AUP, as you've said, um, and you're based in the US. Um, we can hear your love for goblin mode. Uh, what do you think about the other two? Oh, I think this is a strong uh, set of uh, nominees here, and it reminds me of, again, with the American Dialect Society, uh, where we nominate uh, possible candidates for Word of the Year and allow people to vote. And uh, often expressing different aspects of our life in these times. And these three choices definitely do that. I mean, something like metaverse, which you know comes out of the world of technology, where so much of our new language comes from these days, um, and you know, kind of a brave new world of technology in this case. Um, and then something like um, hashtag I stand with. I mean, hashtags as a kind of a vehicle for uh, social movements and, and activism have been Im very important. Uh, I know American Dialect Society, for instance, picked hashtag Black Lives Matter as a word of the year in 2014. With I stand with, I mean, it shows the way that, you know, the people uh, use this kind of particular linguistic frame, if you will, in order to express solidarity with causes around the world. And then goblin mode is something a bit more frivolous, but still, you know, speaking to the time. So I, I, I like these three choices, and I think people will have fun arguing over which ought to be uh, Oxford Word of the Year. Brilliant, brilliantly pithy. Thank you so much. Um, and you mentioned speaking to the Times, and um, I can perhaps anticipate uh, a question or two that we might get from uh, from our, our viewers, which is, you know, obviously we've talked a little bit about um, a year uh, of crisis. I mean, can we use unprecedented again? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we have had so much going on and it continues to go on. So we might be asked, are, are we steering away from those defining moments, um, you know, those choices? So, Catherine, can I ask you what you think about that? Yeah, I think that's a great question, but I'm not sure I agree that these words do steer us away from those defining moments. None yeah. of them on its own encapsulates the entire year in and of itself. But as we've all been discussing, 2022 probably isn't a year that can be summed up neatly. It's been so full of events and contradictions, and those are in turn experienced very differently by individuals depending on their personal circumstances. Um, but in their own ways, as um, my co-panelists have been pointing out, um, those words all do touch on some big questions about how we as individuals and communities grapple with a time of change and uncertainty. Um, so ultimately, linguistic communities create and adopt the words that they need. So if you look closely, any newly prominent words and phrases, they always tell us something about the conditions that created that gap or that opportunity for a particular expression to take off. So if a, there's no such thing as a trivial neologism, if it's, genu if it's genuinely used, if it's genuinely increasing in usage, then it, it, it always tells us something about ourselves and our time. Yeah, I would have a, a thousand pictures. Um, thank you for that. Now I have a final quick question. Um, and um, I think I'm gonna ask Ben and maybe Catherine as well. Of the three choices, um, I'm going to ask you to stick your necks out and choose your word of the year. I think we know Ben's, don't we? But <laughs> I'm I, I'm very convinced by the goblin mode. I have to say it was fairly new to me, but I love the idea of dispensing with any kind of filter and need to, uh, you know, to look the part, someone who detests selfies. But I think on balance, I'm going to go with hashtag I stand with just because we've talked a lot today about community. Um, you know, we've mentioned the community of goblins, but essentially, we've talked about how these three words really show sort of people working together in some way um a metaphor certainly you know all about social connections and I think I stand with you know after a time where we have been out of touch both physically when we weren't allowed to touch people and and you know in the sense of communication that actually I stand with and that sense of solidarity I think really speaks to the moment so I'm going to go with that one Ben you're going to surprise us 
I'll stick with uh, Team <laughs> Goblin Mode, I think. Okay. Uh, although, again, those other two are great choices. I like um, I Stand With in part because it's so flexible. And that would be an, an interesting choice to make. In fact, um, you know, maybe people would support it by saying hashtag I stand with, I stand with. I'm not sure. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> meta. <laughs> that's very meta. Yeah. Um, so, oh, wow. <laughs> bringing it all together here. Yeah. OK. Thank you. And Catherine, uh, are you able to make a choice? Yes. And I, I'm going to go with metaverse. I love a literary coinage. I just think it's that, that's like one of the, the types of coinages people think it's more common than it is. And so it's yeah. great when it works. But there's also something here that I think is so compelling in the parallel between what's happening now with metaverse, which was coined in 1992 in a, in a science fiction novel, and the term cyberspace, which was introduced mm. by William Gibson in the early 1980s. So as a, as a child of the 1990s, I remember when cyberspace was being used to describe the new way that humans are going, the, the humans and the digital world are going to interact. And it became a word that genuinely, young people won't believe this, but it was used unironically. And now here we are with metaverse and you never can predict anything in, in uh, lexicography. Will this stay with us? Will we be talking about the metaverse the way that we talked about uh, cyberspace? Will our uh, children or grandchildren look back and think that it's kind of corny? I don't know. It just makes me feel alive with possibility. And I, I love how um, the same themes come up again and again in our language. Yeah, it will be fascinating to see because I remember when everyone was talking about uh, Metaverse and it was really spiking. There were a few eye rolls, weren't there? But I remember that with cyberspace as well. So it will be really interesting to see what traction um, it has. Thank you so much, um, all of you. That was a fascinating discussion and it's not finished yet because we are going to go over to um, some questions from, I keep calling them viewers as if we're on countdown, our audience. Um, but just to summarise, uh, over the next two weeks, um, we are, well, Oxford uh, is asking the public to have their say and vote on whether of their team metaverse, hashtag team metaverse, I should say, hashtag team goblin mode, or hashtag team I stand with um, across AEP social media channels and via the all important webpage, which is www.oxfordwordoftheyear.com. And I know we'll be monitoring the conversation, keeping score, and the winner will be announced on the 5th of December. So that gives us two weeks. But um, as I say, over now to the audience, because I'm sure there will be some burning questions, which hopefully will pop up on my screen, um, if there are any, and if people have um, typed a few on in the course of the discussion. So looking eagerly at the box at the bottom. Any questions? Oh, OK, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> Fiona, I'm going to ask you this one, if I may. Um, yeah, it's a hard one. <laughs> yes. Um, and they used to be called Octothorps, didn't they? Hashtags. And for, anyway, let's not go there. But are <laughs> hashtags really words? Well, they're a stylized form of words. I mean, it's true to say that if you're looking up a head word, uh, to use a bit of jargon there, a head word in a dictionary is the, the, the search term, the thing that you're looking up. It, yes, it is true that you're not going to find a hat some, yet anyway, something with a hashtag at the start of it. But I think they're a really important feature of current usage. Um, and in fact, there's quite a lot of entries in the OED where we've used hashtags as part of the evidence for it. Things like COVID, long COVID, um, hashtagging, sports washing, that kind of thing. Um, I think we're also seeing, and this might be interesting because this could have implications for whether at some point we are going to see a dictionary head word with a hashtag at the start of it. You start to see a lexicalization of it. So by that, I mean you're seeing people referring to the I stand, hashtag I stand with mob or the hash, you know, that kind of thing, dismissing them as slacktivist people who want to sow division rather than show support in that sense. So that could be pointing towards it maybe becoming a word with hashtag at the start of it in its own right. Um, I always say I never second guess language because if you do that, you're always going to lose. <laughs> but who knows, maybe that will become the case. Yeah. OK, good answer. Very democratic answer, which is very appropriate. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions um, coming in? I think we do. Okay, this is a nice one. What makes a classic word of the year? And what makes a lasting choice? Because we have been talking about, uh, you know, some of them 
just uh, exploding um, and, and sort of rising fast and then possibly falling away fairly quickly. Um, would anyone particularly like to speak to this one? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to choose. I'm gonna be be like the teacher here. Um, Jonathan, do you have an, do you have a view on what makes a classic word of the year? I think um, something. I mean, we've already talked about selfie, but I think uh, selfie's a, a very good example of something which spoke so much to um, our experience of the world in that year. And also, we talked about the fact that people we've talked about the fact that people didn't necessarily recognise it, um, but at the, at the same time, I think um, it can provide people with it's it's a it's a useful tool. All languages, tools, and um, giving us something that we can use for a part of something that's becoming part of our experience more and more. As se taking selfies was at the time we chose selfie. Um, I think that's. I think that'd be my choice for a classic word of the year. Mm, but yeah. other people might have other uh, examples. Well, it was quite interesting, actually. Sorry. It's, no, we all want uh, to talk at the same time. Yeah, no, well, it's obviously is a really good choice for that for that reason. Because, I, um, Fiona, I remember you saying, uh, we were just talking before, um, that actually, you know, we were talking about goblin mode, would people recognise this? And you said, you remember people saying to you, a selfie, what's that? Yeah. And, yeah. and now look. Um, Which so, seems crazy, right, that somebody yeah. would think that. I think, I think Jonathan's totally right, though. Um, and one thing I think that makes a classic... Uh, word of the year and actually this mean this is a good example as well maybe of it not having to um to be lasting or in that kind of sense is that if when you hear it if you can think oh I bet that was 2000 and whatever and one of the ones which actually hasn't made it into any of our dictionaries yet is um I'm gonna get have to get this right and not say the wrong word repudiate which I think will definitely resonate with um our American friends um, and of, that will definitely set you in a time and place. That was the American word of the year uh, in that particular year. And that will definitely take you back to a particular time and place. So I think it has the power to do that as well. And sometimes that can be even more present in the words which haven't necessarily got that staying power. And it's also circular as well, isn't it? Because mm. I remember one word of the year, and I can't actually remember which year it was, was squeezed middle. And there has been mm -hmm. a lot of talk about squeezed yeah. middle um, yeah. after the uh, the recent budget. And Ben, you wanted to come in there as well. Oh, yes. And, and Fiona, the right, refudiate, which was this uh, Sarah Palinism, was the US uh, word of the year for Oxford back in 2010. <laughs> Um, and another era. And yeah, it's, it's interesting always to look back on these as a kind of a time capsule or expression of the particular year. Obviously, some years there are words that we know are going to last, you know, whether in 2020 COVID, 2021 yeah. Oxford's choice of vax. I mean, these are words that are not going anywhere, right? And we know they are going to last. But in general, we don't have crystal balls. We can't figure these things out and what is going to last. Turns out selfie lasted, uh, but uh, other ones haven't. Um, you know, with the American Dialect Society, we have categories for most likely to succeed. Uh, and sometimes we call it right, sometimes we don't, but that's not necessarily what we're trying to do here. Again, we're, we're not trying to predict the future and, and what's going to last, but really look at what speaks to the time we're living in right now and whether that lasts or not, that's up to, you know, future generations to decide. Yeah. yeah. I can I just, I was just going to say that I think um, looking back at the list, actually, uh, what's striking is that what people are going to be picking up maybe in the future is the fact that uh, sort of quite a long time ago, we had carbon footprint as our word of the year. And then a few years ago, uh, our UK word of the year, I think that was. Mm -hmm. um, and we had climate emergency a few years ago. And we're still talking about COP27. And I think that uh, is really striking that those actually merge as a kind of a theme that keeps coming up again and then yeah yeah absolutely um i i'm tempted to ask you the question that i absolutely loathe this would be very impish of me but whenever i give an interview about word of the year fiona you probably um will agree with this you're always asked do you have an idea what the word of 2023 will be or what the word for next year was um so uh is it is it very mean of me to ask you i yeah. just Okay. <laughs> I won't ask. I, I always, I always have a, a now an answer to this, and I've given it every year, and it's still not been uh, the time for it. But um, 
you, I'm sure, working on the OED will be familiar with Respair, which mm -hmm. has got one record in the OED, but Respair is fresh hope and a recovery from despair. And I would love us to feel the time where we can bring that back. So that I'm not predicting it, sadly, but it would be lovely if that was the year of 2023, the word of 2023. Um, do we have any more questions before we wrap up? Ah, okay. That's actually a very good question. Which words almost made the list, uh, but didn't quite? And uh, quiet quitting uh, is in the mix here. Now, I think that was probably on Collins's list, if I remember rightly. Mm -hmm. not, I'm actually not sure. Uh, but um, if Fiona and Jonathan, are you able to tell us what the contenders were that didn't quite make Ooh. it? There were all sorts, weren't there, really, Jonathan? Yeah, there's, um, I'll say platitudes because you don't like it. Uh, I'm really I glad don't that. That. I don't mean that. You do like it. I'm sure you do. Um, <laughs> yes, I don't have neutral. feelings. Yeah, um, there were all sorts of words that uh, we could have chosen. I mean, this is always the problem. It's in some ways it's slightly arbitrary to pick a short list or yeah. even you know one choice. Yeah, um, I can't say it. Sorry, <laughs> no. <I laughs> Platy jibs was one, but we could have also chosen something along the lines of energy poverty. Yeah. fuel poverty something like that so I think we are aware that by choosing a number of words that we're asking people to vote for um there were also other ones that we we could do but you know you can't you can't have all the words there. No, and also this is very much based on data. So they're sort of supported by data and then we are inviting the democratic approach exactly. by asking people uh, to vote. So that feels like a really nice mix. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up unless there are any more burning questions coming from the audience. Just give it a couple of seconds. Oh, okay. What do the panelists think the three selections say about where we are in the world right now? Um, gosh, Catherine. <laughs> I think we've spoken to this a little bit already, haven't mm. we? That actually, even though it might feel like we're not confronting reality head on, each of these words does actually speak to a reaction or a response in some way. I would say just that uh, I think all three choices um, suggest that we're kind of looking for connections after a couple of years yeah. of feeling very disconnected from the world. Yeah. Um, with the metaverse, you're connected virtually, let's say, with, with uh, people perhaps across the world, a new kind of connection. Hashtag I stand with, um, you obviously you're making connections with groups that you, you know, feel uh, like need to be supported in a social movement. And goblin mode, you know, that's again a, a way of connecting with humor, which is very yeah. important, I think. Um, and and the way people are using social media, especially these days, to um, make each other laugh, just be like, "Here's a silly yeah. video of me sitting on my couch." Again, it yeah. might seem silly, but we need that silliness. These we days. do, and reconnecting with oneself as well, perhaps, because we also yeah. get that—that's a really important connection too. Um, yeah. I, I I know. Well, all of us could sit here and chat about word of the year and just words generally uh, for hours, but I'm aware that there is a, a an end point to this and I would just finish by saying thank you to everybody for participating um, our wonderful panelists but also um, all the people who um, have come to see and hopefully share our excitement in what is really quite a unique moment I think in the history of Oxford's word of the year and I genuinely can't wait to hear the results of this final vote. Once again, 5th of December is when it will be announced and people can uh, make their choices on www.oxfordwordoftheyear.com. Uh, so here's to respair, here's to connections and um, here's to some, some good news. Um, but thank you so much again to everybody who has shared this hour with us. And um, yeah, I can't wait to see what happens.